turned out that that was a little too big for the Enhanced 2E. The Enhanced 2E has a self-test routine that is dispensable and wrong. It's only two pages long. The Unenhanced has a four page. By the way, it does a much worse self-test. The two page version is a very clever self-test. <laughs> the four page, not so much. Um, which all goes to show you something. Uh, so anyway, I decided to go for the Unenhanced ones because I could fit my code in nicely. And it was an active boot. This is when the Apple Freight 1 comes up. It, uh, it comes up and, and says, uh, uh, is there anybody out there who can boot me? Anybody can boot me? Anybody can boot me? Anybody can boot me? And uh, so every, every, every little bit, it's going out on the net requesting to be booted. I thought that would be good because I could imagine that you've got a net running and everything, and somebody plugs one of these things in, and so it has to announce itself and say, hey. Uh, it turns out that having an active boot is what took the extra memory because there's some protocol associated with requesting to be booted, having, getting back, getting an ID, and proceeding to actually do the boot, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, oh, that's the other thing. The machines don't have an ID. They don't know who they are. So the master has to assign them who they are, so they get a unique ID. And if you think about it, there's nothing about, there's no serial number or anything in an Apple II that allows you to say, I'm different from him. When you turn on power, all Apple IIs are the same. Uh, in fact, they're more the same than you would think because Apple IIEs actually reset the video generator. They don't come up in a random state. Apple II Pluses have a random state with respect to the video generator. So if you count, if you go looking at the ghost bites on the bus and look for vertical blanking, the number of those, the number, amount of time that goes by before you find it is kind of a random number. But not for an Apple II. All the Apple IIs will see the same amount of time go by before vertical blanking, which is... <laughs> That doesn't work. So my first idea was to stick a bunch of resistors in the paddle three that were different values. So I read paddle three. I said that's good enough. I'll use that for an idea. Um, and um, and that, that was my first protocol. But it had an unfortunate effect that the boards would come up with uh, sort of random IDs. They'd be shuffled. You know, like this would be machine two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven, like that. So what's that? Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, I'll be darned. Well, I just learned something about ESD, friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is this carpet and my rubber soles did the job. Green screen. So, thank you for noticing that. I'll worry about it later. Yeah, uh, screen <laughs> yeah in fact, we, we can reboot. I'll turn it off for a moment. Um, oh, that's the other thing. So, it's powered by PC power supply. This is the same PC power supply. When you reboot, normally you can switch off and switch back on again, and it forgets that it was, it, it's a cold start, right? You figure out it's a cold start. And that's because the plus five drops far enough, fast enough, that the memory loses its state in just a couple seconds. You can turn it right back on and it boots. Uh, that's not the case when you're using a PC power supply that's got bigger capacitors. So interestingly, I found I have to, and particularly this top board, which seems to have, uh, to hold up its memory, when the voltage even gets down to like 0.5 volts or so. So I have to wait like 15 or 20 seconds. Otherwise, the top board goes back into, it doesn't actually reset. So I think it did, though. Oh, where am I plugged in? Oh, I'm plugged in there. No, that's what it should be doing. All the green light should be on. And that should be pressing. No, not that. We'll worry about that later. So <clears throat> that was the first go around. Uh, and it worked quite well after a while. By the way, I changed the boot protocol from everybody bidding uh, just on the basis of what panel 3 was. Uh, instead, I ran another wire along the side from PB2, uh, from AN2 to PB2, a daisy chain, each machine going to, from my PB2 to his AN2, uh, my AN2 to his PB2. And then I would, uh, that, that's initialized low, uh, high. And then I, after I got my ID, I would drop it low, and that would give permission to the next guy to get his ID. And so then it goes, whoop, and gives them all IDs in sequence. It looks kind of nice. It's much easier to count when they're all in order. So this thing couldn't travel. It, uh, it, it shakes. You know, I mean, these, these little slots are cut with a saw. And uh, well, yeah, just maybe, in a, maybe you're careful in a car, but it certainly won't fly. So. <clears throat> I got interested in building another one when I realized I still had all these enhanced 2E boards, but of course that was the reason I didn't use them before, because they were enhanced 2Es. 
Uh, but I got to thinking about what could be done. If, if I only had two pages, what could I do? So I gave up the active boot. And I decided the thing to do was to have the systems come up. When they're cold started, they come up just listening on the network for a boot. And that, they don't know who they are. Uh, they, they have no IDs yet. But they're just waiting for somebody to give them some boot code. The advantage of that is that the boot code can then contain the part that signs on and gets the IDs and all that stuff. So there's like a stage one to boot and a stage two. And that, that, was a, that worked out pretty well. I could fit that nicely in much less than about a page and a half of code. So this one actually is like 350, 360 bytes. It also uh, was a chance to build one that could hang together. And uh, this is all done with metal standoffs. So everything is uh, pretty tight. You know, the external standoffs but three internal pillars of standoffs are also there, which stiffens it up pretty nicely. And uh, could I just blow it again? <laughs> I have to learn to touch ground first. So, I think it's just this, the process on screen saver. Oh, ProSol? Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that, that, was, that worked out pretty well. I was a little worried about that, but it worked out quite well. This, has a, this is on a plexiglass base to prevent setting it on top of something that would short out the bottom board or anything. Um, in the process, I decided to scale it up uh, since I had more boards to do it with and because it seemed like the next logical step was 16. I already had done some music synthesis and 8 wasn't quite enough. Uh, you know, a lot of things seem to require more than 8 voices at the same time. And I also wanted to get rid of all the noise and the sound output. Uh, what I did with the original crate for sound is I just tapped off the speaker outputs and mixed them together and low passed it, and that was the output. That sounds OK, except for one thing. Uh, the plus 5 in the region of the sound output is really pretty noisy. It's got all the hash from the board on it. So even when the, they're in, mixed in with each, each oscillator's output is right. So that's, you get that constant background noise that's always underneath it. So I decided the way to fix that up was to take the logic output off and use that to drive an inverter, but, and that inverter is powered from quiet 5 volts inside this sound mixing box. So I double regulate down from plus 12 to plus 5, filter the heck out of it, and use that to power the, 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 the three inverters for the 17 channels of sound. And then of course mix that down with resistors. So, and uh, again, this is for parallel programming. And 